All right, everybody, welcome back from lunch. I hope you're all well caffeinated and ready to go. Uh, in true AWE spirit, we saved the best for last on Thursday afternoon, not only to have a really, really cool session coming up right now, but of course at 345, we have the much anticipated Augie Award best in show announcement in the show wrap, so don't miss that. That's always, always, always a lot of fun. But right now we have a great little session for us. So enabling the metaverse with AI-driven 3D avatars. Pretty cool stuff. Our speaker for this session is Hao Lee. He's the co-founder and CEO of Pinscreen. And it's a startup that builds cutting edge AI-driven virtual avatar technologies. Um, but it's not all games for Howe. Howe is a distinguished fellow of computer vision at UC Berkeley, former CS professor at USC. His work is focused on the digitization of humans, capturing their true performances for immersive communication and telepresence in the virtual world. Howe has way too many more awards and recognitions to mention here uh, without me running out of time. So let's just bring out Howe to the stage and have him educate us on all this great stuff. Welcome. All right, thank you so much for uh, being here. It's a great pleasure to be speaking at uh, AWE. Uh, again, my name is Hal Lee. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pinscreen, AI startup that builds uh, virtual avatars, and also a distinguished fellow at uh, UC Berkeley. First of all, I'd like to start with my talk with um, a vision that I have, right? So I believe that uh, the future of communication has to be three-dimensional. And it's not only because the world we're living in is three-dimensional, because I also think that it's the most natural, intuitive way of interacting with one another. And if you think about how we're going to communicate in 3D, we will have to have a um, virtual representation of ourselves, right, in the form of digital avatars or in the form of a video capture that is three-dimensional. So I think this uh, video that you see over here is really nice. Um, this is a concept video created by uh, Microsoft. And what they show are two forms of digital representations of a person, right? So one is a um, video capture that is uh, volumetric, and the second one is a 3D representation of it. Now, seven years ago, um, when I was a professor at uh, USC, uh, we had a visit, actually, from a uh, chief scientist at um, Oculus back then, then Facebook, and then uh, now Meta. Uh, uh, Michael Abrush actually came to visit uh, our labs and he was basically selling the idea that, you know, Facebook back then wants to have, wants the world to be more connected and more open, right? And the idea is basically that people are going to live in the metaverse and have the ability to interact with each other. The first question I had was, well, if you are trying to control your avatar and you're wearing this huge thing on your head, um, how is it going to map your expressions? How is it even going to capture that, right? And so we started the first collaboration, actually, with Oculus back then. And it was a pure research collaboration that was uh, published and presented at uh, SIGGRAPH uh, back in 2015. And one of the prototypes that we built was basically a virtual reality headset that has the ability to sense your facial expressions and reenact an avatar of, your, um, yeah, of yourself. So this is like a really early prototype, so it looks uh, you know, really bulky, so you have this like depth sensor that's attached, uh, looks like an elephant nose, and you also have contact sensors that are basically measuring your muscle activations on your face region, right? So basically to capture everything around your face. A Couple of years later, uh, we developed a more sophisticated uh, solution, so that was one of the early headsets that have uh, built-in IR uh, cameras that has the ability to see what is happening actually inside your goggle, and also used a very cheap um, PlayStation uh, camera that is attached on the mouth. So a purely optical capture system. And one of the new things that we developed back then was we incorporated the idea of using deep neural networks to capture facial expressions, right? So that was another SIGGRAPH Asia paper that we presented. And now fast forward a couple of years, I'm pretty sure many of you have seen, um, Facebook Reality Labs, or now Meta uh, Reality Labs, <clears throat> is basically showing um, new possibilities of, you know, basically enabling telepresence using virtual reality headsets and using avatars that look photoreal, right? So the technology behind this is called Avatar Codec. And before this kind of technology can go on the market, uh, what you need to know is that it requires, you know, around 50 cameras that are placed around the subject in order to capture uh, the entire uh, performance of the person, right? So you need to 
put 50 cameras, you need to record all the performances, you need to train a deep model so that you can actually reenact the performance in real time inside virtual reality. And one of the latest demos that we're, they were showing um, showcases how you can actually digitize an entire performance in real time uh, using multiple cameras that are tracking the person, using new technologies based on neural rendering that allows you to put the person inside a virtual environment. So one thing is nice, right? You can see, you can interact, you can see the other person in 3D, but one of the issues here is that this communication is one-sided, right? So one person wears the VR headset, the other person can't see the other person in 3D. If both are wearing the VR headset, then you'll see the other person with the VR headset, unless you have a 3D avatar. So that's basically the main difference between an avatar that is a parametric model and one that is actually based on a volumetric capture system. So we're gonna talk about both uh, today. So what we are building at Pinscreen is basically um, an approach that allows you basically to make the creation of avatars as simple as taking a photo. This is the only way to really democratize the process of creating digital avatars. And the challenge here is the following. It's really, really hard to actually turn a random camera that you're taking in random environments, we call them unconstrained environments, and turn them into a high quality avatar. Most of the avatars that you see in movies and video games, they're captured inside a studio environment where you place multiple cameras around the person, you put highly controlled lighting environments, you even ask sometimes the person to perform certain facial expressions so that you can actually capture um, personalized faces. So the problem we are dealing with is how do we digitize a person from an unconstrained capture, right? But if you were to provide this information to a highly skilled digital artist, he might be able to use his interpretation, use his experience to convert that into a realistic model. So the approach here is to use deep learning to, for that. So many of you have probably heard of, you know, some of the advances in deep neural networks, right? So some of those are in the area of deep generative models. For example, GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks, that allows you to basically generate highly realistic uh, photographs of people and um, <clears throat> simply from random noise, right? So you basically train a deep neural network using real photographs of people, and from random noise, you can actually generate a photograph of another person that may not even exist in reality, but still looks like a high quality uh, photograph of a person, right? So this is um, a state of the art method called StyleGAN2, now there is StyleGAN3. Um, this is uh, developed by NVIDIA and the original method was uh, pioneered by uh, Ian Goodfellow who now works at Apple. So what we want to do now is to have a 3D version of this, right? It's not, it has to be an asset that we can actually reuse inside an augmented or virtual reality environment, something that we can use for the metaverse. So one of the techniques that we have developed and published at uh, CBPR this year is called uh, normalized 3D avatar synthesis. So let me tell you, let me explain to you how this works. First of all, we want to capture a unconstrained photograph of a person. Then what we do is we use an encoder decoder architecture to first extract the likeness of the person. After we extract the likeness of a person, which is represented by a high dimensional feature vector, what we do is we use a decoder that doesn't decode a 2D image, but decode directly into a 3D model of a person. How does that work? Well, first of all, the way it works is that instead of generating only an image, what we first do is we generate an image where every pixel isn't RGB colors, but it's an XYZ position. The second thing that we do is we generate another texture map that is, you know, by default already a 2D image. And by com combining both things, we can actually generate a 3D model. So this sounds really simple, um, but the main problem is there isn't as much data for, um, you know, training these kind of deep neural networks as there is for 2D photographs. The problem is we need three-dimensional data as input. And the second thing is for supervised learning, what you need is you need photographs of hundreds of thousands of people. And what you also need is basically their 3D 
faces, but normalized. Normalized means how does that person even look like when they're captured in a studio environment? How does that person even look like when he's not smiling, right? So the only thing we have are limited numbers of 3D scans of these people, and that's far, um, this is way uh, too little to train these kind of deep neural networks. So one of the things that we do is we actually use AI to generate more of these data. So that's called augmentation. And the second thing that we need to do is basically we need to have a second step of this approach which uses a concept of differentiable rendering which transfers the final likeness from the input image onto the uh, final uh, asset, right? So the whole process is divided into two steps. The first step is to generate a rough um, 3D model of the person, and the second one is basically to have a refined process to generate a, you know, the final likeness. So we're transferring that from the original input photograph to the person. So what we can achieve is the following. So I can show you a couple of examples. These are extreme pictures where you know, the input photograph is highly unconstrained. You have, it's even hard for a person to even imagine what kind of skin tone they actually have. But having this normalized 3D synthesis approach allows us to incorporate these 3D avatars inside any lighting conditions. So the reason why normalized 3D avatars are important is because you have to use these avatars in a new virtual environment. You need to enable relighting. And the second thing is you need to enable 3D animation. Next, uh, you'll see uh, a demonstration um, how this actually works. So this is uh, one of our engineers, uh, Tsujin, who's actually in our uh, offices. Uh, and he's just taking a photograph of himself. And as you can see, he's actually smiling. But what we can do now is from that photograph, generate a complete 3D avatar of the person. The body is a you know, generic or can also be custom specified. So you can specify things like weight and height and it will automatically rig the avatar to the person. So this is probably you know, one of the easiest way of generating your avatars. It takes around 30 seconds. The first step actually only takes less than a second and the iterative refinement that transfers the final likeness takes around 30 seconds to generate. All right. Um, here's a glimpse of what we're working on. So these are the next generation avatars that we're building. So this has enhanced um, uh, 3D assets. So we have better textures, um, high resolution uh, details on the geometry and also strand based uh, hairs. And this is something that we're developing right now uh, for both Unreal and also Unity Engine. Um, now you've seen how we create static avatars, right? The next step is basically to animate them. Now, we can use a traditional approach to bring these avatars to life. So that works by having a controlled rig that you can actually use a performance to drive the avatar, or you can ask, uh, use some CAD animation. But one of the things that are very hard to achieve is to basically get very realistic facial expressions. So one of the approaches that we have developed uh, is called neural face rendering. So our technology is called PAGAN, which stands for Photoreal Avatar GAN. And the idea is that we can incorporate a, um, let me show you again. We can incorporate a CG input. So this is incorporated inside uh, Unreal. And we can basically generate a realistic facial expression of the person just using a couple of minutes of recording of the person. So this is something that um, we have um, incorporated with one of our partners at uh, Zozo Next. So Zozo Next is um, one of the top clothing companies in Japan that uh, recently got acquired by uh, Yahoo Japan. And uh, what they're trying to build is basically replace virtual fashion models with uh, virtual beings, right? And uh, what we're trying to uh, demonstrate here are basically a scalable virtual production pipeline that allows us to create a large number of these video clips uh, at scale. So we can create these kind of videos within a few days uh, completely from scratch. And one of the things that you can see is that we're resolving the bottleneck for realistic faces using this uh, pagan technology. So let me talk about um, uh, the next item. So. What we have been showing is basically how we can democratize the creation of 
parametric models uh, for virtual avatars. Now, the other approach is to use volumetric capture, right? So this is something that we've seen a couple of years ago. Microsoft has shown, you know, with holoportation, and you can probably see in the booth, uh, many different solutions that are, you know, even real time uh, for capture and for streaming. But one of the problems here is that, um, I mean, the nice thing here is that you have multiple cameras that are capturing the person and um, you, can basically you can basically digitize the person as they are, right? Um, so this is really convenient because you don't have to convert them into a you know, parametric model, et cetera, but the main issue here is that you do need like a studio type of setting, right? And um, the issue is that um, you know, it's hard to imagine that people are going to have a studio capture you know, in their homes in the future. So the question is, how do we democratize this process? So I've been wondering since I was watching uh, Star Wars, um, you know, how, how in the world did uh, Princess Leia create her hologram? So she was certainly not standing inside a capture booth. Uh, there was probably not a depth sensor around her. Actually, there, I think there weren't even any cameras. But one of the things that uh, I've been wondering is, would it be possible to digitize a 3D person from a single camera, right? And I think this is really important because this is how we communicate th these days, right? So everyone has a phone, so a single camera uh, setting is something that is very plausible. So what we did a couple of years ago is we started to think about can we actually use 3D deep learning to digitize an entire 3D model from a single input image? So this is a collaboration between uh, my former lab at USC, Waseda University, and UC Berkeley. And uh, we started off with this input image, so it's a picture of me in Sydney with my friend uh, Mike Seymour. And we use um, you know, semantic segmentation to remove the background. And what we did is we developed an approach that could digitize my entire model from that single input image, including the texture. And the idea behind this is to train a deep neural network that can actually infer a 3D model from a single input photograph. The naive approach is basically to extend a deep neural network that is 2D to 3D to use voxels, but the problem is that voxels are very hungry in terms of memory. So the first thing that we did is we replaced the idea of using voxels to implicit surfaces. So the idea is to, instead of explicitly defining the occupancy of a 3D model, we define it using what we call an implicit surface. And the second key idea here is to use a pixel-aligned representation, right? So the idea, normally you have a deep neural network, you take an input image and you map it into a single feature vector. What we do here is we enforce the intermediate representation to have the same resolution as the input, uh, as the input image, right? So basically each pixel has its own feature vector that still takes into account the global information. So by combining these two ideas, we were able to take random photographs of a person and they can have clothings and uh, we can digitize a 3D model from that. There's still a problem. This method here takes around a minute to generate a single uh, 3D model, right? So this is not something you can deploy. It can't be used for any real-time application. So volumetric telepresence still isn't possible. So what we've done is we have modified our method to become real-time using um, you know, a smarter data structure and specific scheduling algorithm to use multiple GPUs. And what you see in this demo here is a 100 bucks Logitech camera that can digitize the entire person, including clothing, in 3D and in real time. And we're also showing how we can actually stream this 3D content into uh, an AR device. Uh, and it's, a, it's an iPad that has AR capabilities. And you can actually stream the content remotely. So I believe that this uh, type of technology is sort of like one of the, you know, core building blocks for many things that we have seen in science fiction movies such as Blade Runner, how you can have holographic displays, have the ability to communicate in real time, how you can actually build digital avatars. We're still far away from these kind of visions and for, 
from real holographic uh, te uh, technologies. And I think in the meantime, one of the things that we'll probably first see are AR and VR um, that is using um, you know, AR and VR headsets. I think um, most likely in the next five to 10 years, we'll still be using these kind of technologies, but hopefully it will become a lot more mainstream, a lot easier to use. And for now, um, one of the things uh, that we have developed in, together with a really cool company uh, in LA called Magnopus is a metaverse application that allows you to um, you know, digitize yourself as an avatar and also visit, um, uh, visit uh, Expo 2020, uh, which is held in Dubai. And they did an amazing job basically of um, using our technology to digitize uh, your personalized avatars. You can also customize yourself and you have the ability to have this you know, digital twin to you know, teleport yourself into, um, into the uh, event. So here's a little teaser um, for the uh, Expo Explorer. So you can download this on uh, the App Store or also on the uh, Android Store. And um, yeah, so you have the ability to visit uh, different um, pavillons uh, at the event. All right, so um, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm ready to take questions now. Big round of applause for Hal, please. All right, we have a couple of microphones down here in the front. If anybody has any questions, please run up. And uh, that way everybody who's uh, watching uh, virtually at home will be able to hear what you're talking about here. So uh, step right up. Thank you. Hi, how's it going? Uh, so the, uh, the camera you're using in the demo, is a depth camera? No, it was a pure RGB camera. Oh, awesome. Thank you. That was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have anything uh, else? There we go. Hello. Uh, do you think that it's possible to democratize content too much when we look at 3D models in the context of things like deep fakes. So, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So <clears throat> in terms of, um, yeah, so there is definitely a concern when you allow people to create anything they want. And um, <clears throat> this is a problem that we didn't have in the past. So. For example, in the context of uh, deepfakes, uh, so one thing that you can do now is um, you can basically make people do or say anything you want. And in the near future, you'll probably have more capabilities where you can um, arbitrarily de-age age people. I mean, you can already do that with uh, certain sophisticated uh, filters um, and you'll have more and more capabilities. And one of the dangers is that um, you will <clears throat> basically allow people to create and modify content that can't really be verified if they are authentic or not, and they become entirely um, realistic, right? So what was possible already for a decade with images, you'll probably have with videos, and we're used to that videos are something that um, you know, we would normally trust, but it's something that probably we won't be able to trust anymore. So. We're actually working with uh, DARPA on certain efforts on how to prevent uh, these kind of dangers. Um, one of them is the ability to detect if something, um, if certain media has falsified content. Um, that's going to be getting more and more increasingly difficult. So one of the um, ideas is to basically detect what is actually hard to, um, how, um, how to detect if something is uh, real or not, as well as malicious or not. But that's a very, um, yeah, th there's a lot of things to talk about this. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm wondering how long do you think it will be until some of these really high quality avatars can run in real time on a lightweight mobile headset that also needs a lot of compute for you know, rendering the rest of the scene? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, <clears throat> uh, as of right now, um, mobile devices, I mean, 
the best quality you can get is probably what you see in video games, right? If you just look at Call of Duty, it's probably pushing the limits of what's possible on, on you know, for multiplayer uh, universes and what's probably possible on a headset. Um, the problem, for example, for volumetric capture is that it's, it takes a lot of bandwidth uh, to, to stream. And the problem with neural rendering is that it requires, you know, high-end GPU. So usually they depend on a tethered device where you have like a cord that's running on a big uh, machine next to you. Um, <clears throat> I think um, it's going, I think it will take a couple of years for mobile devices to get these kind of capabilities. But um, to add to it, I think I'm optimistic because in addition to um, you know, really more sophisticated mobile devices, what you'll also have to take into account are edge compute. And um, I think there's a lot of people who are, think I mean, AR and VR is, you know, a big driver for edge compute um, infrastructures. And uh, that's sort of like where I could see uh, a future there, right? So basically, instead of having Wi-Fi, uh, you basically have uh, GPUs that are running there that can solve some of the low latency, um, you know, computer vision problems uh, that people need locally. You can't put everything on the cloud. Um, so I think this is, yeah, this is something to take into consideration. But if there is a need and if there is a interest and there is money in it, um, you know, hopefully, you know, in the next five to ten years, we'll see like another jump in terms of uh, avatar qualities. Uh, I do think that parametric models will still be there for a while, and that's for all these fancy stuff that we see in research, like neural rendering, will still take a while until they get deployed. Thank you for your comments, and hopefully those edge compute costs go way down, because they're so expensive right now. Sorry, what? I said thank you for your comment, and hopefully these edge GPU compute goes down in price, because it's so expensive right now. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you can be real quick, we're just about out of time, so shoot it yeah, quick. Yeah, no, I, I really have a good one, and I think that it's important to understand. Uh, I'm wondering if you had any studies about the consumer reaction to the avatar's output that you're doing. Are they happy with that? Do we really want a digital twin of themselves? Uh, in the business world, is it going to work when you're looking someone in the eye and trying to close something? Is the reaction going to be you know, valuable for us? Uh, um, yes. So we've been in the space for almost a decade. And um, there were different phases of people's reaction to avatars. Um, I would say in the beginning, it was a serious concern whether people prefer stylized avatars or if they preferred photorealistic ones. And the problem with photorealistic was that you know, the quality that we were able to generate back then were much lower than what we have nowadays. And people's conception of what is photoreal is still like this now, uncanny valley. And nobody's really happy with what they see in the mirror, right? <laughs> well, that's true. But that's the advantage of the avatar because you can fully customize and you can create a better version of you of right. what they So like. that's not so real time. You need to spend like 15 minutes, 20 minutes until you find the right format. So I'm, I'm really trying to see if you had any studies saying, yes, you know, it's... I actually, I mean, there are some research papers that do some studies about that, but I don't think there is good studies yet uh, because there isn't much data about that. Um, but uh, intuitively, um, I see that I, th I, I firmly believe this is the future of how people are going to represent themselves. Because, it, I mean, people use their photos on Instagram and there's no question of peop if people are going to show themselves. Uh, Self-expression is in the nature of any uh, social interaction, especially a digital one. Um, so I think whether people want to be themselves or someone else or something that kind of looks like them is, I think, a different question. But I think that avatars, I think, are really, really uh, here to stay. Um, but I think, but you're raising an important question, which is like, is it like how they want to see themselves or not? Um, I don't think there, to answer your question, I don't think there is a good, there is even a good study out there that I know of. Um, but uh, my intuition is that um, photoreal is important, but probably what's even better is a better version of photoreal, 
especially when you see how people are filtering themselves on social media, so they create a slightly better version of themselves. Thank you. Looking forward to it. All right, that's all the time we have. Great conversation, great questions. Thank you so much, Hal. We've got a great next session coming up on gaming. We have some furniture to set up. Don't go anywhere. And please don't forget, 345, show wrap and Augie Awards. You don't want to miss it. It's always the best part of the show. Thanks, everybody. See you back in a few.